going on everybody welcome back to the channel so if you are new here which i'm assume it's going to be a couple of you guys that are new here this video will more than likely get pushed to the financial side of youtube which is cool so if this is your first video welcome I'll tell you a little bit about myself my name is akeem along with my wife missy we built our dream home we started uh we wrote the contract in the end of 2020 and we closed at the top of 2021 and on our youtube channel we take you through that entire process decorating it furnish it and then we're also a family of seven so we have five kids four boys one girl and we do family vlogs home decor content lifestyle so if you're into that type of thing also consider subscribing if you're not just check out this video and it'll probably be a couple more financial videos coming down the pipeline as well so if you guys aren't new here and you've been rocking with us for a while then you knew this video was coming it's been one of the most highly requested videos um, that we've had based on the comments in the comment section uh, dms and everything like that so you know how to save uh, for your dream home so i want to tackle that i'm going to give you some of um, the top ways that i recommend my clients to uh, start saving some of my friends a um, little bit what we did as well and i'm also going to give you some bonus information if you stay tuned to the end because if you know the mortgage no not mortgage the real estate industry right now um is a little bit different than it was six months ago so interest rates are higher um it's been a little bit of a slowdown so you know what does that look like so i'm gonna you know get in detail and tell you a little bit about some of the other questions I see you guys asking, you know, is there going to be a crash? Are the home prices going to go down? Is 2008 going to happen again? And if not, what's the difference between now and 2008? And so on and so forth. So if you stay tuned to the end of the video, I'm going to answer all those questions. But for now, let's get into the top ways you can save for the down payment and closing costs and all the money you need to purchase your home. All right. So first and foremost, if you watched um, our previous video, I think it was the last video, the manifesting video, you know, I'm a big, big fan of reverse engineering or beginning with the end in mind. So it's kind of hard to have a goal if you don't know what the end goal looks like. So um, what I mean by that is if you know you're looking to buy a home, you know you're looking to build a home, whatever that may be, you need to find out, you know, how much that home is going to be, you know, what your budget's going to be. And then you can kind of calculate and find out how much money you will need to save by, you know, whatever date that is. So typically, um, right now, most homes don't fall within the FHA range, but let's say, um, let's say the home you're looking at does fall within the FHA range. So that's going to be three and a half percent down payment or if conventional, the minimum is typically 5% down payment. So whatever your home amount is, you're gonna need between three and a half to 5% minimum just for the down payment. And then you have the closing cost side of things. So that's gonna be prepaying your insurance, your escrows, things like that, amongst other things, HOA fees if you have them. A good rule of thumb is about three to 4%, I say three and a half right in the middle. Three and a half percent of the total home amount will be uh, what you'll need for closing costs, right? So you, know, you combine those numbers or whatever that number will be. So let's say that number is 40,000. If you know you need $40,000 minimum to be able to buy, purchase your home, then that's a good starting point. Now keep in mind, you can't drain your bank accounts and then come to the closing table. You're gonna have to have assets or reserves as we call it in the bank to show that after you close, after you give, the bank and everybody, all their money that you still have money in the bank to live off of. So you need to pad that a little bit more. So, you know, when you get into things and you realize, okay, 40, let's say 40, $50,000 is how much you need. And if your goal is to purchase a home in two years, then you know how much you have to save going forward every month on top of what you already have saved. If your goal is six months and you know you have zero in the bank, that's a pretty lofty goal to get to 50,000. But either way, you have to start you know, with the end in mind. And once you figure that out, it makes everything else easier. All right, so tip number two. So now that you reverse engineer and you realized you know, how much money you're gonna need to bring to the clothing table, the second thing you need to reverse engineer is, or not necessarily reverse engineer, but figure out is how much will your new mortgage payment be? So in most situations, you're either renting or living with friends or living with family right now. So there's a difference between how much you're gonna pay in your mortgage coming up and how much you're paying in rent right now. So a good thing to do is save what your new mortgage is gonna be. So for example, let's say you're renting an apartment. Let's say that, um, let's say $1,300 a month is the rent for your apartment, right? 
So, but your new mortgage is going to be $2,500 a month. That's a $1,200 difference. So what you can do is start to save the $2,500 or the extra $1,200, sorry. Save the $1,200 per month and put that to the side. One, it'll help you save money. Two, it will get you used to paying um, what you're going to be paying coming up with your new mortgage. And that's going to help you with budgeting as well. Because you, if you're, depending on how well you do budgeting, um, it can come as not a, not a shock, but how can I put it? If you're used to having so much money disposable after you pay your rent, you know, this will kind of condition your mind and your bank accounts and your pockets and everything to, you know, how much disposable income and things you're going to have after you, you know, pay your mortgage and stuff coming up, you know, whenever you purchase your home. And then once that day actually comes, um, it's repetitious to you. It's like riding a bicycle. You're used to it. It's not a shock. You can move on with your life because you're used to doing it, but it's also a good way to save. All right, so the next thing, I think this is number three. I'm gonna say three. So the third thing is, this is a big one, right? You have to be honest with yourself. You have to know if you're an active or a passive saver. Me personally, I've converted. I used to be terrible at being an active saver. So an active saver is somebody that can budget, that can look at their income coming in and they can put money aside and make sacrifices and they, they pay themselves first. They save first and that's never an issue. Um, that wasn't me for a long time. Um, a passive saver is someone that if you take the money from them, or you th they take the money from you, before you get to it, then you don't have a problem with it. So that's like your 401k um, and other ways where they come into your account or you know they go through your payroll and they take the money and put it to the side before it gets to you. So you have to be real to see if you're an active saver or a passive saver. And once you know who you are, there's ways that you can help. So if you're an active saver, you're good. You you pretty much understand that you know how to sacrifice your money and put it to the side to you know reach your goal. But for those that are passive savers, there's a couple things that you can do to help um, increase the frequency and how much you're saving your money. So the first thing that I tell people all the time is, especially if you're looking to um, buy a home specifically for this purpose, is to go in and increase your contribution to your 401k. So a lot of people put in the bare minimum or at least enough to get the company match. If you increase that, so let's say the company matches up to the first 3% or the first 6%. So you put in your 3 to 6%. If you were to change that to 12% and they're going to take 12% of your gross um, income and they're going to save it or put it in your 401k for you, then when that money doesn't come to you, you're okay. That money's set aside. Then when you come, to, it comes time for you to um, purchase a home, there's programs that allow you to take the money from your 401k without it being a penalty for the purchase of a primary residence. But the good, the part, the good part about it is that money was already put aside for you in a very passive way. So that's uh, you know something that I highly, highly recommend for a lot of people. And the second thing, it kind of works the same way, but it, it comes out of your bank account. So it's an app called Digit. And Missy and I, we use this for a while. So if you're not familiar, and I'll try to summarize it as much as possible, you know, not sponsored anything by Digit. So you connect Digit to your bank account and then you can set goals within Digit as far as what you want. So you have a rainy day fund, emergency fund, I need a new car down payment fund. You set up the parameters and what happens? So Digit will scan your bank account and you can set minimum thresholds, but they will say, okay, you have four or $500 in your account. I'm going to take 20 out. Two or three days later, you have this, you know, two, three, four, five hundred dollars in your account. They'll take 40 out. So they take money out of your account in random increments and they put it to the side. But again, you have control. So you can tell them the maximum amount that you want them to take out at one time. So don't take more than fifty dollars out. Or you can say, don't take any money on my account if my balance gets below a certain dollar amount. And there's other um, parameters and things you can set. But the cool part about it is you can give it an uh, end date as well. So you could say, hey, I need to have $5,000, $10,000 saved by 2025 because that's when I'm going to buy my house or six months, whatever your date is, and it will do it for you. And if you, um, let's say you get into a situation and you need some of that money back or it took some money and it caused you to get an overdraft, it's very simple to go into the account and request some of that money back. And then if it did cause a fee, they usually cover it for you. So I highly, highly recommend Digit App, even if it's not for saving to purchase a home, if it's just for saving 
in a very passive way overall, um, especially for young kids. If you have kids that are, you know, starting out, they just got their bank account, but they like to spend money and they don't know about saving it, set them up with digit because once the money's out, they really can't do anything about it. And as a parent, you know, you can kind of help them with that. But digit and increasing your 401k are good ways to you know, save money to get to that end goal, which hopefully, if you're watching this video, is to buy a home. So those are, I guess you could say that's three and four, but I'm, I'm gonna call this three, that's tip number three. All right, so for the last tip, I, so my neighbors decided to cut the grass right now. So I hope it's not too loud, especially with me wearing this mic, but they're going back and forth. So it'll pass if you hear it a little bit. But the last tip is, um, I'm not sure how widely known or unknown you know, this is, but you can receive gift funds from um, family, um, friends to assist with whatever the, you know, your closing cost down payment um, is. So it can't be mattress money. So it has to be a paper trail. They bear, have to be able to show where it came from. So a parent can take from their 401k, um, they can take from their savings, you know, things like that. Brothers, sisters, cousins, um, anybody can contribute gift funds. And I know there's limitations on how much, but it's pretty lofty. Um, and you could talk to your mortgage loan officer or mortgage banker, you know, to get into more details, but you can get a gift, gift funds from family members to assist with that. You know, I know some people come from situations where, you know, family may not have it, but some people do. So that is an option. Um, unfortunately there's no like magic pill, you know, for saving money. It's just something that you have to do. Um, whether you want to invest it, whether you want to buy a house with it, whether you want to buy a car with it, whether you want to put it aside for your kid's school, it's just something that we have to learn how to do. So it's, it's no magic pill, you just, it takes discipline. You know, so I try to give you a couple tips, if you will, that can help, you know, spread that along um, more efficiently. But again, there there's no magic formula. It's just something that, you know, we all need to do if we want to reach that end goal. So, so you know, hopefully those tips help. And if you have... Um, more detailed questions or specific questions, leave them down in the comments below and I'll try to respond to you as quick as possible and answer to the best of my knowledge. Now, if you stayed this far, um, I'm going to now tackle some of the, the bigger looming questions um, that we have or a lot of you have as far as, you know, what is the overall conditions right now of the, of the market as far as buying a home and should people buy a home? Should they wait, wait for a mortgage crash? Uh, all those different things. So. Um, Let's get into that. All right, so let's tackle one of the questions that I hear absolutely almost every day from people. You know, with the recession that's looming, that the media is pushing, say we're about to go into a recession. If we're not already in a recession, will home prices drop? Absolutely not. So a recession has no correlation with home prices. Um, as a matter of fact, if you, and I'll try to post the information below or I'll put the graphic up here somewhere. Of the last four or five recessions, home prices actually increased during the recession versus decreased. The only one where home prices went down was during the 2008 recession, but that recession was caused by the mortgage industry. Now I'll get into a little bit. Um, I'll get into more of that later, but um, prices aren't going down. We still have a home shortage. And if I know where we are in Texas, they're putting up apartments left and right. I would say within a 10, mile range of where I live, there's probably, this is no exaggeration, there's probably 20 to 30 different, you know, six, 700 unit apartments going up. Um, we don't have housing. We usually, within a, a 20 year span, build 20 million houses and we built 10 million um, since 2008. And there's a shortage. The generation of, not the baby boomers, uh, the millennials are into home buying age and there's no homes, so you still have a supply and demand issue. And more importantly, again, this recession that's probably coming up and coming out of the pandemic is not caused by um, mortgages. So you're not gonna have a home price drop. I actually think you're gonna see home prices go up for a couple reasons. One, rates are higher. So people aren't moving now out of luxury. In the last two or three years, the mortgage industry, we saw a lot of people buying homes because they could, not because they had to. So you have less people looking to put their home on the market because they'll have to go buy a home with, um, usually at a higher price and at a higher interest rate. So you have less people selling their homes. So that inventory is gonna shrink, which means typically in new construction, 
you're going to have an increase because there's less of those homes available, which means the demand for the new construction is going to be higher. Basic economics, supply and demand, prices are probably going to go up. Um, hopefully rates do come back down and they always will. But with new construction being the the bulk of where home, people are going to be able to buy their homes, I believe that's going to actually push the cost of new construction homes up. Now, don't get me wrong, you're going to start to see deals and incentives and things that kind of went away in the last couple of years. They're going to come back, um, especially on the new construction side, but you're not going to see a wholesale discount. Homes are 50% of what they used to be. That, that's, just, that's just not going to happen. So, I mean, you don't have to take my word for it, but that's personally what I believe um, as far as, you know, home prices being cut in half. Truck just went past. All right, so the next thing is, should you wait for interest rates to go down? And in the grand scheme of things, no. Rates will always fluctuate. Rates will go down, but like I just said, home prices won't. So I have family members that are in the market right now. I have friends that are in the market right now. And to tell you guys the same thing I told them, secure your asset right now and refinance and, you know, get a lower rate when that time presents itself. Because typically it's a seesaw. If home prices go up, rates typically go down. If rates go up, home prices typically go down. But the last two years has thrown that seesaw off. But I think it's going to start to come back to earth a little bit where you're going to see that norm. That doesn't mean, again, that doesn't mean you're going to see huge discounts on homes. 30, 50, 60 percent off. You're not going to see that. But you will start to see the, the ebbs and flows come back again. And that's my dog right there. Shh. Okay. So you will start to see those ebbs and flows come back again. But um, in the grand scheme of things, if you have the means to buy a home and you need to buy a home or want to buy a home, whatever it is for you, and you just don't want a high interest rate, buy the house now. Go ahead, secure your asset, and then when the time presents itself, refinance your home, lower your payment, and lock in at a lower rate then. Because if you wait till rates go down, I can guarantee you the home that you're looking for, one is gonna be probably more competition. I can guarantee you there's gonna be more competition and the home is probably gonna be a lot more expensive than it is today. So get the home now, lock in your price, and then refinance later when the time permits. All right, so lastly, um, again, a common misconception and a common um, thing that we see, and I understand why, but um, will this, will 2008 be replicated by today? Or what is the biggest difference between um, what's happening in 2022 going into 23 versus 2008? So, and I addressed this in a previous video that um, I did about a similar topic maybe a year ago. But again, I address it now because it's, it's a lot more prevalent now um, than it was then. But you have to understand what caused 2008. So in the years leading up to 2007, 2008 crash and recession, there was a lot of subprime lending going on. And if you're not familiar, subprime lending is just lenders that will lend out money to less than typically qualified individuals. It's like going to a car lot instead of going to the main dealership, you go to the B lot that's on the corner with the you know, used car salesman. So you had a lot of loans and a lot of people had loans that you know they couldn't afford. There were loan programs that were, they seemed predatory. Um, I talked about this again before and we had, you know, there were loans that you could do where there was no income and no assets needed to be documented. You had loans where you can state the income and state the assets on paper without necessarily furnishing proof. As long as they, um, as long as the credit score was like 720 or better, 760 or better, then we didn't have to document any income or assets information and you can go buy a home. You could make, you know, $80,000 a year and go buy a $800,000 house and it would be approved. So. Those type of things, along with um, adjustable rate mortgages, were very big at that time, which are starting to come back. But it was the education around it at the time that was uh, misleading. So people got these adjustable rate mortgages. And again, if you're not familiar with what that is, it's a loan in which the interest rate is locked for 
a certain period of time. So if you see an adjustable rate mortgage or arm, it will say like seven slash one or five slash one, three slash one. That just means for the first three years of that loan, the interest rate is locked. And then after that, it can adjust once every year. So that's what the one is for. And it adjusts based on prime rate or the LIBOR rate, um, plus two, plus three, whatever it may be. So, and then that payments are interest only. So in a typical mortgage payment, you have the principal and interest that you pay to the bank. Um, but on an adjustable rate mortgage, you can pay just the interest, which I was going to make your monthly obligation a lot lower than if you um, were paying principal and interest. So that gave people the comfortability to you know, buy a much more expensive home than they could afford because they're not paying any principal so that the um, they're not paying down the principal on that home. So when those uh, on loans adjusted and the lock period expired, and now it went into a principal and interest payment, the payments ballooned to the point that a lot of people couldn't afford it. And they ended up walking away from those homes and foreclosures. So the foreclosures went into the market and foreclosures typically sell well below market value. And that brought all the other adjacent properties down as well. So that's what kind of caused the 2008 crash. But again, that's not, what, that's not what's happening now. Um, people are qualifying for these homes. You know, the, the requirements, the lending requirements have been tightened up by previous administrations uh, to make sure that, you know, when you get the green light to go buy a home, um, they vetted you enough to know that you can afford it. So there's no more stated income, stated asset loans. You know, they're doing full documentation, um, making sure your income is up to par, making sure your assets are up to par. So when you buy that home and the banks know when you buy that home, it's something that you should be able to afford based on how they look at it, right? So there's not a lot of subprime lending. There's not a lot of uh, predatory loans going on um, to kickstart what happened in 2008. This is merely an economical situation, which typically a recession is, but there's always money to be made on it. And um, a friend of mine, Carlos, he actually posted, I'm not sure where he got it from. He may have came up with, I'm not sure, but I give him his credit. He posted something and I thought it was, you know, pretty cool and I'm paraphrasing, but he was, he said, uh, it was like good news or bad news, depending on what it is, it usually depends on what side of the money you're on. And the example he gave was, you know, everybody's complaining about, you know, fuel prices, gas prices being up. But those that invested in these fuel, fuel companies, you know, your share Vars, your Exxon, if you go back and look, pull up Robin Hood right now, you go look and see what their stock prices were three months ago, six months ago, when gas prices were typically okay, compared to now, you would have made money. Matter of fact, you would have made so much money that any increase that you're paying in fuel, you would have made it on the back end by their um, by their stock prices are going up. So you just have to realize what side of the money you're on and make sure that you're on the right side of it. So no matter what happens, you're making money. So the mortgage industry is not going to be affected that much by this uh, looming recession. But as you can see, the stock market has already taken a hit. This is the time to invest, just like you did at the beginning of the pandemic. Right now is the best time to invest so you can grow your money and you can get these stocks while they're on discount, while they're on sale, and let it grow. But that's a subject for a different day. Um, I can get into that too, so if you wanna hear more stock information, comment below so I know that you're interested in that information. I'll put out a couple videos about that. And I'm trying to figure out, do I wanna add more to this channel or do I wanna do a separate finance channel? About 99% sure I wanna do a separate finance channel, but um, yeah, that's the way I wanna go. So all in all, I hope this video was helpful. Um, again, comment below with any questions that you may have um, additional to saving. And then if you have any questions about um, other finance information that you want to know, or you want me to dive a little deeper about anything I say here that I didn't touch on enough, and, you know, let me know in the comments below. But until then, I'll see y'all in the next video. Hopefully Missy will be with me. We do some shopping, stuff like that. We got projects coming up. So until then, peace.